Good afternoon. We're here this afternoon at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. Today, November 16th, 1998, we have the opportunity to interview Mr. William Ernest Gaither. Good afternoon, Mr. Gaither. Good afternoon to you. How are you? Just fine, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're living right now? I'm living in Shrewsbury right now. And are you married? I've been married to the same lovely woman for 52 years. And what is her name? Edna. And may I ask you how old you are, Mr. Gaither? 93, last June. Well, happy birthday. Thank you very much. And you have children? I have one son who is a doctor in Newton Wellesley Hospital. Area. He is a doctor. And what is his specialty? OBGYN. And you have grandchildren? Six grandchildren. Six, okay. Where were you born, Mr. Gaither? I was born in Paris. Paris, France. Paris, Texas, that is. <laughs> Paris, Texas. Pardon? Paris, Texas. Oh, Paris, Texas. <laughs> and were you part of a large family? I was the youngest of eight children, four boys and four girls. And how long did you live in Paris, Texas? Until I was 27 years old. And being the youngest of eight children, uh, what did your parents do? As they, far they, were, they had a 110-acre cotton farm in Texas. And you grew up on the cotton farm? Yes, uh-huh. Did you help on the farm? Oh, yes. Did you have any specialty on the farm that you were responsible for? Not really, just anything that had to be done. And being the youngest of eight, uh, did the others sort of take care of you, or did they expect you to hold your own? I held my own. I was the youngest of the, of the group, and incidentally, I'm the last one left of the group. Mm -hmm. They're all gone. And your parents, your dad, um, worked the cotton field? Yes. Um, until his death? That's or, right. And how old was he when he passed on? He was 83 when he died. Mm -hmm. And was this a family farm, or is it one that he, he alone purchased? or? Uh, it was a family farm. Uh, let's see, one or two, let's see, would be two of the older ones, the older boys, left the farm before I came along to help with the work. They had gone to jobs like a railroad job and a cotton mill in Western Texas. Now, once your dad passed away, was there someone else in the family to carry on the farm? Well, he didn't die while well, we were still on the farm. We had moved to a small place in the city of Paris. We left the farm and moved into the little city. When he got to the place where he could no longer do all that hard work. Now, growing, tell us about growing up in Paris, Texas, what it was like. Uh, granted, you said it was on a farm. Did you go to school off of the farm? I went to a country school, one teacher for all the grades, until I moved into the little, uh, into Paris, which was the... Uh, uh, the, the town itself. The you town itself, into. yes. Mm -hmm. So once you left this one teacher, and was it a one-room schoolhouse? One-room schoolhouse. What type of school did you go to after that? I went to a uh, school in Paris. I went to uh, high school in Paris, Paris High School. Mm -hmm. Was it very difficult for you to move from a farm community to a town? I loved it. You loved it. <laughs> what do you remember most about it? Well, on a farm, you were up at by the time you could see, and you're out in the field working, this is during the seasons now, mind you, by the time the sun's up, and you might work until 11 or 11.30, and you quit, and if you're close enough to your house and your home, you go to your home f for lunch, where my mother had cooked all the morning. So, when I moved to that little city, 
I was very pleased to get away from the farm. Sure. That wasn't for me. Do you think your Although parents... Although I did my job on the farm. Do you think your parents were pleased to also get away from the farm? I think so. I think so, yes. I think so. So she would cook all morning for oh, lunch. And was your lunch your main meal? Not really. That was just lunch. Dinner time, she had cooked another dinner. She was cooking constantly. Mm -hmm. And taking care of all Besides of the children. Besides all the housework and washing and ironing. Incredible. And did she live to an older age? She lived also to 83. She My did. father was eight years older than she was, but he died eight years before she did. So actually they both died, each I should say, at 83. At the age of 83. Mm -hmm. Uh, when did you come to Natick? I know you had lived in Natick for a while. I moved to Natick in uh, July of 89. And what brought you to Natick? To be near our family. Mm -hmm. We had no relatives in uh, Maryland where I was living at the time. And they wanted us to move up here to be near them. Now, did you go into the service out of Paris, Texas? No. Mm -hmm. Tell us after high school. No, I worked. At the, I was working at the government printing office in Washington D.C. when I enlisted. And how old were you then? I was thirty-seven. Were you at the time I enlisted? Yes, in nineteen forty-two. Let's back up a little bit between high school and the age of 37, after high school. Okay. Okay, what did you do after high school? I just mentioned having worked at the government printing office. Mm -hmm. I worked at a commercial printing firm in Paris, Texas, as an apprentice bookbinder for five years. That was a five-year apprenticeship. After that five years, did you feel that you were very knowledgeable about the bookbinding business? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because when I went to the government printing office, that's what I went there for, as to work as a bookbinder. And after your apprenticeship, what did you do? Well, the apprenticeship was before I went to the government printing office. I went to the government print printing office as a full-fledged bookbinder. Now, book bind, when you use the word bookbinder, that involves rebinding books and also gold tooling and even designing gold tooling on leather bound books. And the tooling the would be the design or the lettering? Explain you, you, tooling. Actually there's all kind of designs on those leather bound books. And The type that is used to put the gold lettering on the books is brass and it's heated on a gas stove. The type is locked in a what they call a pallet with a handle on it and you go across the back of the book like free handed. This is not nothing mechanical, it's all free handed. It's almost a lost art nowadays. And how long did you do that for? I did that until I enlisted in the Navy. So at the age of 37, and you were living outside of Washington, D.C. at that time? Silver Spring, Maryland, uh huh. And were you married at that time? Didn't marry until I got out of the service. Okay. So at the age of 37, you were single, mm -hmm. and you, you decided to enlist because the, the, the country was at war at that time? That's not exactly the reason I decided to enlist. Okay. I knew that sooner or later, if the war lasted long enough, that I would be drafted. So I enlisted while well, I could still choose my own branch of the service, which was the Navy. And you wanted to choose the Navy? I did, uh huh. Why? Well, actually, they were the only one who would give me a photographer's rating in order to enlist. 
they needed photographers at the time. I was strictly an amateur, but they they thought that I was good enough to work in the laboratory. So they gave me a photographer's rating, which was the equivalent of an army sergeant. Right from the very beginning, it would have been that time. I enlisted as a photographer, yes. Mm -hmm. And in that enlistment, did you stay in the Washington, D.C. area for a time? The first two years was the Naval Intelligence Laboratory in Washington, D.C. as a darkroom technician. And during that time, what types of photographs, or are you at liberty to say, that, that would come across your Everything lab? was that could possibly have any bearing on the beaches of Japan or anything that could possibly be involved. People who have postcards, they would take those postcards and copy them. That would show pictures of beaches or buildings, whatever, and they'd make 25 copies, 8 by 10 copies, of everything they copied. Any kind of documents or photographs, anything that might be used. To, was it to get a sense of the landscape of Japan and Abs other areas? Absolutely, mm -hmm. because they knew very well, sooner or later they would invade the, Japan proper. They knew it that early on, in 1942? So. Yes. Did any other members of your family or any close friends join the service? Not that I know of, but I did have a brother who was in World War I. But and, nobody... And what was his name? Emmett. And he served in World War I? World War I. In Europe? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how long was he gone for? Uh, something in the neighborhood of one year, I, th I believe it was. Did he, when he came home, did he talk to you about World War I at all? Not very much. Uh, he, he didn't like to talk about it, actually. So we didn't push him. But he did have a, a long session with that flu that wiped out so many thousands of people, you know, at the time. He had that when he was in Europe and was in a hospital for about six weeks. When you went into the Navy, did you have to go through a typical basic training? No. We didn't. Uh, enli uh, enlisted man did, but uh, a man with a rating didn't have to go through that basic training. So you had this special rating right from the very beginning of your military career. Right, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And you were in Washington, D.C. That's where I was for the first two years. And did you have a group or um, a unit that you worked with specifically? No, that was just a general uh, laboratory with, it must have been 15 or 20 other enlisted people in there. And were they all men? No, there were some waves, which made it nice. <laughs> Did you date any of them? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you were there for two years. Um, was there any point in time during that two-year period that you wanted to get on with some other? Yes. I heard about these combat photo units that were being formed. And there was a Navy captain in Naval Air Station who was interviewing volunteers for these combat photo units. Now I might say right there that when I say unit, a unit was four men. That was a Navy lieutenant who would be in charge of the group two movie cameramen and one still cameraman. That would be me. You were the still cameraman? I was the still cameraman, yes. 
So not only was this unit there to take pictures, which was your responsibility, but it was also to record and film some of the different aspects of the war? Any aspect, everything. We were practically on, our, the photographers were practically on our own. When we were aboard a ship, like the, the large carriers, which we were mainly out in the Pacific, our lieutenant who was in charge of this group, he left us on her, our own. He said, you know what you're here for, and you know, have to, you're supposed to know what you're doing, so do it. Just do it well, so which you, I think we did. So you basically had free reign on the ship to be anywhere at any time? We had free range of the entire ship. It would go any, anywhere on the ship we wanted to, which we thought might be an advantage spot when we were attacked by the enemy planes, which we were many times. So after your two-year stint in D.C., where did you go after that? Right from Washington, D.C. <clears throat> to San Francisco, where they put us on a small aircraft carrier that was on its way to Ulithiato, which was just about as far out in the Pacific as you can get. Can, do you know how to spell that? Yes, I do. U-L-I-T-H-I, mm -hmm. Ulithiato. So you were on an aircraft carrier. Did you know at that time where you were going? We were told where we were going, uh-huh. And we were going right there for a purpose, and that was to join the fleet which was in command of, at that time, Admiral Halsey. So you're under Admiral Halsey's command? At the time, yes. Did you meet and him? In a short, yes, I did. And a short time later, he was, for some reason, he was removed of his command, and Admiral Nimitz became the commander-in-chief of the Pacific. And we were attached to his command. They called it Sink Pack, which is Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific. Tell us a, a little bit about a typical day on this aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific. There was never a, a dull moment when you're on an aircraft carrier. Always action, mishaps. Like what? Suppose that the pilot coming in to land on that deck. Well, he made a little bit of a mistake because the, the ship itself is rolling or it's on a, going with the swells up and down or sideways. He might make a little bit of error and miss the arresting cable which stretches across the deck, which there's a hook on the tail of the plane which catches that That cable that stretches across the deck and a hydraulic system brings the plane to a stop. And if he misses, he might bounce and miss that cable and crash into whatever was in front of him. So sometimes they were killed, sometimes they just, it, they bounced and went over the side and they would have to pull him out of the water. Was it your responsibility to record that? Absolutely. Anything like, anything that, uh, might be of benefit to the future of the airplane, aircraft carriers. Because later they did bring in jets, but that was a little bit later than my time. Was it difficult for you, especially the first few times that you had to record something like that happening? Was it, do you remember it being difficult or you see so much of this, it's like, I suppose you say it's like chocolate candy. You can take so much of it, and you become sort of numb to the feeling of uh, sympathy for the pilot and that sort of thing. It just, it's, you're there for a job and do your job and that's it. 
once you took these pictures, were they sent to a particular place? Yes, they were. They were sent to the, the Naval Laboratory on the island of Guam. That's where the base laboratory was, was uh, located. They were processed there and then sent anywhere that they had a need for publications back home or newspapers or whatever. So if they were put in a newspaper, was your name credited to the picture we at all? We had no credit, no, it just be naval photograph. Mm -hmm. So you were on the aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific. Was that your first, your first aircraft carrier? Uh, yes, the first one, yes, uh-huh. And then were you transferred at any point in time? Yes, uh, after, Admiral Hall, after Admiral Halsey was removed from his duty, Admiral Nimitz came along and took his place and at the same time changed his carrier to a brand new carrier which was the USS Hancock. Was that larger than the previous one? Uh, no, it was the same class, but it was new. <clears throat> Did you know at that time that you were under the leadership of gentlemen whose name today means quite a bit to so many people? Oh yes, I, we do. We, that's where we were going. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. The two movie cameramen in my unit were professional newsmen in their civilian life. Do you remember their names? Gove and Iceland. The two names. They were professionals in their civilian life. I was a strict good amateur. I had to talk my way in to getting into one of these combat photo units. Did you feel that as the time went on, you got better at your profession? Oh yes, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from, from other, some of the other photographers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'd get, uh, get together from different units, occasionally, not very often, but when we did, most of those fellows had been professionals in their life. And I picked up points from them and I learned a lot from them. Tell us some of your uh, more difficult experiences. I know you had mentioned <coughs> to me off camera um, that you had been in the Pacific, as you mentioned earlier, the South China Sea and the Philippine Sea. So, were you taken to areas that were going to be active in the war effort? Were you... Repeat that, would you please? Yes, I'm sorry. No, um, when you were on the USS Hancock, for okay. instance, were you ever taken from that carrier and sent elsewhere because they felt that there was newsworthy happenings going on in, elsewhere? In other areas, you mean? Mm -hmm. Actually, we were with Admiral Nimitz on the USS Hancock for several months of the time that I was in the fleet. During that period of time, what kind of action were you seeing on a, on a daily basis? We were under attack. Well, the first attack that I was involved in was 27 enemy planes attacked the fleet. And one of our carriers, the USS Ticonderoga, let me say this again, Ticonderoga, was hit by a bomb from one of these Japanese planes. But nine of those enemy planes were shot down out of the 27. Nine of them were shot down. Do you, do you remember this day vividly when this was all happening? Oh, indeed I do. Tell us some of the emotions that you and some of your peers felt at that time. Well, like I said, you gradually get used to this. This is my job, and you're supposed to sort of disassociate yourself from 
the noise and all that sort of thing is going on and deaths that you see on the, on the deck. Oh, I could go on for hours about some of these scenes you wouldn't want to see. What, what stands out in your mind as some of the horrifying things that you did have to put aside? That's hard to answer because I had so many of those. So many of them. But if I could mention a couple of them. Sure. I was on the USS Hancock, and one day, general quarters alarm sounded. And in just a matter of minutes, as one of those kamikazes showed up in the distance. I followed him in my viewfinder of my camera until he got close enough that I knew that it would take a good, make a good close-up picture. And finally, I pushed the button, took the picture, and indeed it did come out as a good picture, I learned later. But in a matter of a fraction of a second after I had taken my picture, instead of this plane crashing into our ship with a load of bombs, one of our anti-aircraft guns hit either those bombs or his gas tank and the plane just disintegrated about 200 feet above our deck. Part of the fuselage was on fire, fell on our deck, and bounced end over end. He was going in that direction, you see. He bounced end over end and rolled almost to the end of the ship. Well, in the meantime, our fire crew extinguished this fire and I got down to where it had stopped rolling in time to get a picture of what was left of this fuselage before they pushed it over the side. Now, if they hadn't, uh, if somebody hadn't uh, exploded that plane, I don't think I would really be here because that plane was headed right for the area where I was located. After that occurred, is the adrenaline flowing? What does one do after experiencing something so close? That's hard to say. It's, it's a horrifying feeling. Believe me, it is. When you see that plane come, I could swear that he had my name on the side of that plane, you know? It's that close. And, uh, but you do get used to this. You have to, like I said, you have to disassociate yourself from all that noise of the gunfire, the bomb exploding, planes roaring overhead, all this, all this is going on well, this is at the same time. You just have to remember what you were there for. Do you remember any other poignant times that stay with you after all these years? Yeah, I mentioned a couple of times. The other thing that I had in mind was right at the end of the war, the Americans had dropped the atomic bomb. The war was over. My last assignment before coming back to the States was to photograph the, the surrender of the Japanese forces in the Palo, let me say that again, Palo group of islands, which included Palo. And where is Palo? Palo is in far southwest Pacific. Palo. That's a group of islands. Mm -hmm. And that's where their headquarters were. The agreement with the Japanese was the Americans would anchor in, they would come down in a destroyer escort, which is a small destroyer, and anchor a few year, hundred yards off of the Island, which was the headquarters of the Japanese in that area. They would send a negotiating, te a negotiating team in a small craft and come out and come aboard our ship, and our officers and their officers would get together in a small ward room of this store escort and discuss the terms of the surrender. Actually, there were no terms because it was unconditional, but they called it that. 
So I did have photographs of, of this entire scene in that ward room. But the last picture that I took of that uh, surrender was showed a close-up of the American colonel and the Japanese admiral who were the head men on it, signing these two papers which uh, meant that they actually surrendered these islands. Each officer would sign two papers and pass over the other one. And I remember this. This was in a small ward room with a lot of people in it. And in order to get this close-up picture, I had to stand on the rung of the back of the chair of one of those Japanese officers. And he turned around and gave me a dirty look, but I had come 200 miles to take these pictures, and I wasn't about to go back without them. Sure, <laughs> sure. So that was, that was a, something that I remember to this day. To sit right there, and, with, as close as I am to you, with those Japanese that had just got through bumming the daylights out of us, you know. Where were you? Were you in the Pacific when they dropped the bombs? Yes, I was the there. Atomic I bombs. was out in the Pacific when that dropped. Did in you? fact, I have a copy of the uh, Hiroshima or Hiroshima, whatever you want to pronounce it. After that bomb hit, I didn't take the picture. They they processed this picture in the laboratory on Guam, and they gave us a picture, a copy of it. Mm -hmm. And I still have a copy of that. What was the sense on the ship when, when they heard that the, the, the bombs had been dropped and consequently possibly the war would be over? When I heard that the war was over, at the, I was in the Navy hospital on Guam with a kidney stone. <laughs> so that's when I heard that the war was over. And that was I, had, I said to this doctor, get me out of here. I said, things are going to happen from here on. <laughs> so were you discharged shortly thereafter from the hospital? Yes, yes I was, yes. Now, was that after you had already taken these pictures of the surrender or prior no, to? No, that was before. So you were in a that hospital? The last assignment I had was to take those pictures of the surrender. So did they discharge you from the hospital too early or? Well, Probably a day or so sooner than it would have, but I felt like I was all right. And mm -hmm. I knew the things would be happening. So did you feel at that time that you were taking pictures of a part of history in that? W it never entered my mind at that time, but I can see that now because every photograph that I took, there's a copy of it or on some kind of records in the archives in Washington, D.C. So they've been shown publicly before this time, mm -hmm. or since you took those pictures, they have been shown publicly. Oh, yes. As uh -huh. part of. I could tell you a few little stories if you'd like Absolutely, to hear one. Absolutely, please. Well, I may be getting ahead of myself here about uh, a famous character. Ernie Pyle, the famous war correspondent who was in the trenches with the troops over in Europe the entire four years, and although bone tired, he came out to Pacific after that war was over, came out to Pacific. And I was, took one of the last photographs ever taken of Ernie Pyle. It was just a few days before the invasion of Iwo Jima where he was killed on the island of Iashima. A Japanese sniper, everybody in, in the war zone was supposed to wear a steel helmet, which he did, but the bullet hit one inch below the helmet and killed Ernie Pyle instantly. So you have one of the, you have taken one of the last pictures Let of Let me him? finish tale, tale of this sure. one. Sure. More than 40 years after the war is over now, my wife Ed and I were living in a condominium in, Washington, in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, where they had a small exchange library. 
And one day she was browsing in this library and she ran across a book titled Album of Ernie Powell. She knew I had photographed him and she brought that album upstairs so I could see it. I was fanning through it. I came to page 136. There was a picture I had taken of Ernie Powell 40 years before. A, a writer in, in, uh, at the Washington Post heard about this incident, coincidence I should say, and he wrote an article about it in the Washington Post. And the last sentence in that article told everything. It said, the world is indeed a small place. Yes, it is. <laughs> and when you were taking the photo of Ernie Pyle, were you also able to speak to him about oh, yes. his experiences? Yes, I, I talked to him for just a short time. This was at a, at a little gathering that the, uh, the Navy had gotten some of the war correspondents together just before the fleet was going to pull out for this invasion. And I talked to him just for a few minutes. Do you remember anything he said that might be pertinent to this conversation here? I don't believe so. How old a man was he at that time? It was hard to tell what his age was. He was one of those sort of ageless people. But I would say at the time that he must have been in his 50s. Now just a guess. And entering into this room where you were all gathered, was, was his reputation... Everybody knew Ernie Powell mm -hmm. and loved him. Mm -hmm. Great guy, great guy. Mm -hmm. So now that you had taken some historic photos of one surrender, and there were other surrenders going on, it would be my understanding. Sure. Mm -hmm. So once you took those photos, what else did you have to do then in order to get back home? Give us some idea of what transpired after that period of time. I had been in the war zone about 11 months. And uh, put it together with my age, which was more than most of them, I had enough points to come home. They had a system of points, time, age, and I had enough points to come home. And our, the captain who was in charge of all these combat photo units asked me, he, now, mind you, he asked me if I'd like to go to Japan with the Army of Occupation. But I didn't want any part of that. I had been in the in, in, in Navy three years out, and I was ready to go home. But that's when he offered me a little exchange job there, send me down and, and uh, photograph the surrender of the Japanese forces in the Palo group. Mm -hmm. you, a little trade-off. You were one of the older enlistees. Was that to your advantage, do you think? I, I doubt that very much because I had originally tried to enlist in the Marine Corps before the Navy took me, but they turned me down because of my age. They knew this was rugged duty and they weren't sure that because their age limit was 28, and I was 37 at the time. Mm -hmm. So they turned me down, and they also reminded me that I had had no professional experience as a photographer. Mm -hmm. That's when the Navy, I went over to talk to the Navy about it, and they took me and gave me a, a rating. You had mentioned earlier that you were basically a four-person unit, the lieutenant, the two cameramen, and yourself. Were you together with that one group for that length of time? The entire 11 months, yes. We ate together, we slept together, we worked together for 11 months. Did you, were you able to keep in contact with them after your services? One photographer who was in naval intelligence with me, I kept in touch with him for years. And matter of fact, he just died a few years ago. 
But the other, the other two who were in the combat force unit, we all lived in different states and just gradually lost contact with each other. Um, when you were in the middle of the Pacific and, and taking your war photos, were you in touch with what was happening in Europe and elsewhere? Did you hear on a constant sure. basis? Mm -hmm. We had a daily news broadcast on the ship over a public address system. And we heard what was going on in other areas. Just. And were there times during that broadcast that there would be real positive emotions and then other times that there would be some deflated emotions because of the war effort? Do you remember anything about well, that? Well, they, yes, they, we would hear about uh, some of the things that were happening that weren't good. We would hear that too. So we actually we knew what was going on in different places. Was it uncomfortable being on a ship for that extended period of time? Or, or were you one of the more fortunate ones because of your photography? We had, I would say we had special privileges, actually, because we were, we were called a special services unit. And we had the run of the ship. We had no duties, no KP or any of that sort of thing. We had the run of the ship, and those large ships, it's not nothing. 3,000 uh, sailors on that ship. Did you ever get a sense that the sailors felt that you were superior or that you, did you ever get a sense that they had strong feelings one way or another that you, you did have these privileges? Only from the ship's photographers. The large ships had their own photo section. And this special services unit come on on this ship with them. We were invading their territory, and there was hard there were hard feelings there. Yes, they made it hard until they were told to back off mm -hmm. because we did not we did not invade their their uh, activity at, at all. We were told we were on our own. They had their job. We had our job. Being on the, uh, take a lot of pictures of the Admiral? Not a lot, but I did take pictures of him. I took pictures of him while he was doing the broadcasts. And then, just another instance, I was sent to his headquarters, which was on Guam at that time, to take pictures of him with Archbishop Spellman, who was visiting among the different uh, areas of the of the Pacific out there. Now, it's my understanding he was the Archbishop, and I was sent to his headquarters to take pictures of him with Archbishop Spellman. And you wouldn't believe the difference in one man from while he was in his headquarters. While we were on a ship, taking pictures of him pinning a medal on somebody, maybe, we were kept at the door, and you could count about five until I'm supposed to be in there and take that picture and I'm out of there. So he so made that's it very difference clear in the, that there were parameters in one area yeah. versus another area. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Once you did you come into San Francisco or New York? Uh, Shoemaker, California. Mm -hmm. That was a naval base. <coughs> Excuse me. Once arriving there, were you done at that time? And back home. And what an incredible. The thousands of men were on their way home. But it was. Very well organized, very well organized. So once you arrived there, how long did it take you to get all your paperwork in order so that you could leave? Days. Mm -hmm. 
until we're on a ship going home. Excuse me. And then were you planning to go back to Texas at that point in time? Back to Washington, D.C., the government printing office where I had been working for all those years. The law was that they had to hold your job and start earning a living again. <laughs> but you were involved in this amazing historic experience. And then you just had to go back and pick up like you were three years prior. Right. Was that difficult for you and your uh, peers to do that? Well, actually, I had always been able to adjust readily to most any change or situation. So it, it, uh, it didn't affect me a great deal. It's just a matter of, well, here I am again. Now let's get down to bed and earn a living. <laughs> Do you remember some of your most memorable characters or most humorous, experience, humorous experiences? Well, the character I just talked about was Ernie Powell. That was one. But the humorous, I can't put my finger on one of them, a humorous character. No, I can't. You certainly had some experiences that would be very unforgettable, such as the exactly. kamikaze. Um, when you came home, did you read up on any of the history that you had been a part of as the years have gone on? Oh, yes. Um, even more so than that. After I, I was lucky enough to bring over 100 8 by 10 photographs back home with me. The Navy, uh, the Navy captain who was in charge of all these units told us that any time we were back on the island of Guam, that's where the base full lab was located, that he had set aside a dark room just for the use of the combat photographers. And we could go into that dark room and make a print for ourselves of any of our own negatives, not somebody else, but any of our own negatives that were available in the files at that time. And I spent hours. After I came home, maybe two or three years later, I took these hundred and some odd pictures, made slides of them, copied and made slides, and I put together a program, about 45 minutes it ran, of my experiences out there. And I've shown that program at least 150 times. Did you show it to school children? Oh, yeah. They love it. Really? They had no idea what was going on out there. They had enough, no idea what, what it was like until they'd see the real thing. They'd see movies with all the staged stuff, but that was real. Do you still have the slides? Oh, indeed I do. Perhaps we could arrange a program here at the library. <laughs> I had done this so long, and I said, at the end of this year, I'm going to wrap this up, but I, <laughs> I wish you this before this uh, slight stroke that I may have had. My speech is a little impeded, as you may have noticed. What was the feeling of family and friends when you came back um, and started working back again in the lab? In both the Army and the Navy, the casualties were very high for combat photographers. And my friends and family were just extremely happy to see me back safe and sound. And alive. I did not get wounded. Mm -hmm. How about emotionally? What was it like for you, though? Even though you didn't get physically wounded, you certainly saw an awful lot well, like I said before, I always adjusted quite readily to most any change, and it, it didn't affect me a, a great deal in my later life. So you arrived back in D.C., you took up where you left off in the lab, mm -hmm. and at this point in time you're about 40 years old. Yes. I was just about 40 mm -hmm. years old, yes. And did you know your wife 
then, or did you I meet her? I knew her for five years before we got married. And how long after the war did you get married? We got married in 1946. I came home in 1945, November of 1945, October rather, in 1945, and we got married in May of 1946. Mm -hmm. So that. And then how long did you work in the lab in D.C.? Uh, after the did, war. Oh, after the war. Oh. No, no, no. I didn't work in if at the, I worked at a government printing office. I'm sorry, in See, the printing office. Uh, yes, uh -huh. yes. How long did at you the, work there after the war? Well, I had a total of 38 and a half years at the government printing office. And uh, I retired in June of 1972. So that's 26 years that I've been retired. How important do you feel it was that you served in the military, and how do you think it affected you in your life? I didn't put any great importance on uh, <clears throat> having served in the military. It was just one of those things that was. It was a job that I had to do because I knew sooner or later that if I didn't enlist, they, I would be drafted and then I had no choice in what branch I'd be. So I did my job and I think I did it well. And evidently there are others who thought the same thing because you don't buy these in a gift shop. And why don't you tell us about that wonderful star on your lapel? I'm very proud of this, very proud of it. Mainly because, as I said before, I was an amateur photographer when I went into the service. I had never earned a dime as a professional, and I was in this unit with two highly professional cameramen and they resented me fiercely when I went in. They, in fact, they went to the captain and asked him, hey, what's going on? Are we getting an amateur with us in this group? Well, this captain had put me through a series of tests that you wouldn't believe once. I won't go through all this, but he didn't take my word that I was good, even though I was an amateur. But he put me through a series of tests. He sent me out into, this was at the Air, Naval Air Force, Naval Air Station in, in Washington, D.C. He sent me out onto the f f field where all these airplanes were, some of them being serviced, some of them being repaired, some were taken off, landing. He said, he gave me a hammer in my hand that I had never touched in my life with 12 women. He said, go out and take these pictures. Come back here two hours later. Go right down the corridor here and in that dark room and develop these film and bring them back to me at 2 o'clock. I came back at 2 o'clock with these negatives. And he would take one at a time lay it on one of these light tables, the light under the negative, you know, you see through it. He say, hmm. Take it up, hmm. I didn't know whether the worst picture you ever saw in his life or the best damn negative you ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> but he looked at the 12 of them, he said, very good. So that was it. So these, these professional cameramen resented you up until they found out I knew what I was doing, and then we got along great after that. Wonderful. But the reason I was so extremely proud of this, I was the one that got this, and they didn't. And that is the bronze now, I, star. I, I was sorry they didn't, but it was a, one of those things that just happened. You got the bronze star. I got the medal, and they didn't. Why was that, do you think? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. but. I was never given an assignment of any kind uh, or even taken pictures on my own. I never once 
failed to get the picture that I started to get. During that whole one year that I was out in the Pacific, I always came back with, no matter how difficult the position is, I always came back with the, with the pictures. One of the questions that we ask a number of our veterans that we've interviewed is how you feel about the difference of opinion of the public towards the veterans of World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. Could you offer us some of your ideas I on that? I always said those people who took to the streets in dissension, I would say to them, wake up and smell the roses. You don't know when you're well off. That was always the idea I had about that. If there was one thought or comment or memory statement that you would like to make now for, for not only your family, but for those who will be reviewing this tape in the future, what would you like to close with this afternoon? This is just a thought. There's not another nation in this wide world who could bounce back from a devastating attack like Pearl Harbor, fight and win two wars, and then come back and go right back to our peaceful way of living. With a, with a few faults that we do have in this country, it's still a pretty good place to live. And one final question, Mr. Gaither. With all of your experience, experiences taking pictures during the war, did you keep on taking pictures, whether it be as an amateur, after I'm the war? I'm glad you asked that. I had never photographed a wedding in my life. And one of the fellows that I knew was going to get married after the war was over. And he said, hey, how about taking my wedding? I said, well, I don't know anything about taking wedding pictures. And he said, oh, you do fine. So I did, and that started it. And for, must be at least 20 years, just as a side job, like on weekends, I photographed weddings. And I loved every minute of it. That's wonderful. I loved every minute of it. Every bride has a different personality, and you have to handle each one of them differently. Mr. Gaither, we'd like to thank you this afternoon for sharing with us a memorable story about your experiences. It's been my pleasure. Believe me, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. Thank you.